The way I reckon it, the audience of anyone who presents their researches data set and their own findings based upon it, as I do, begins to be broken down according first into two camps and then into four, etc. On the one hand, or side of the imaginary amphitheater of the idealized audience within any author's future, are those who like the content they are seeing and who appreciate and learn from it. On the other hand, or opposite side of the amphitheater's audience, are those who dislike the entertainment they are witnessing and who jeer and jest at it but learn nothing from it. Within each of these extremities are the hard line and soft line as well, alike a yin within yang and a yang within yin. The hard line of one's fans are those who obsess over a performer and who collect their complete life's works. The soft line fans comprise the vast, silent majority of the audience, generally accepting what is presented to them, but without reaction of any kind either way. The soft line trolls are the smallest group, or so it seems, for their silence cancels their negative reception when applicable, and, when they are not silent, they become hardline trolls, whose opinions are expressed as those of a vocal minority pitted for the downfall of any incumbent on the stage. Let us characterize these traits of the average audience member even more. The first of these groups could be considered the friends of the presenter. Their roadies and crew, their close personal associates, and their repeat crowd, etc. This group rarely exceeds more than 10% of the audience so it is relatively safe to assume that, within any presenter's own psyche, there is only one neuron synapse out of every ten that is firing information off that connects with their audience 100% of the time. The rest of the crowd, like the remainder of the presenter's brain itself, is carrying about excess or irrelevant information that distracts them from connecting to this message of the only 10% useful portion of the brain itself. Friends of the presenter overvalue the material of the presenter for the wrong reason, due to self-associating with the presenter as the content's compiler or inventor. As flies to a flame, there are a class of intelligent people who flock to more intelligent people, those who logically seek out the creative. Whether this leads to, as is often the case with such beta characters in history as Brutus to Caesar, as Salieri to Mozart, or as Verlaine to Rimbaud, them ending up betraying their superior due to some form of love-hate or tough love personal complex remains to be proven universal or not. Additional examples in fiction include Judas and Jesus, the New Testament, Lancelot and King Arthur, British and Saxon medieval myths, Othello and Iago, Shakespeare, Javert and Jean Valjean, Les Miserables, Darth Vader and Emperor Palpatine, Star Wars, etc. The role of the friend of any presenter relative to their content is often with friends like them who needs enemies, because the friend's defense of the presenter's persona supersedes their defense of the presenter's message's content and the presenter's personal material apart from the presenter's person itself. 
because they are a creator. The defense of a friend for any creative presenter runs. They deserve superior treatment. This is, of course, completely false, and when the friend discovers this fact, their perceptual bubble usually bursts and the result is they're seeking out any way to give in to the temptation to reverse their role and betray their idol as an enemy instead. I once wrote, Friends are strangers who it's safe to ignore. Even more than for friends, this holds true for fans. Fans are like people in traffic, who are driving responsibly and who are aware of their surrounding environment outside of their own car's cabin. Surprisingly, this group does not constitute a real and true majority in factual proof per empirical case-by-case -case evidence. Most of the people around one, most of the time, are actually either hostile to one outright or else so utterly oblivious of one's own existence as to be dangerous toward it, even if not an immediate threat. The moral majority, it has also been said, are neither. This is true because the moral are not the majority, and the majority are not moral. A prime example of this was Ron Paul, goading forth a resounding boo from a convention hall full of neoconservative Republicans when he mentioned the golden rule espoused by Jesus Christ himself in the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, the group of one's audience who count as fans are actually the most valuable because they are not outright hostile to the content nor the presenter, as are all trolls collectively, either more or less so, nor are they a potential threat to the presenter's person or personality, as are friends of whom it is said, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. The goal of converting ambivalent, ignorant audience members, or sheeple, formerly called chattel, meaning human cattle, from potentially more distracted away from to potentially more inspired toward one's message is the goal of every public presenter. This element involves the degree to which a presenter is able to share with their audience a feeling of innocent discovery, awe and wonderment, at the data set the presenter uses themselves. However, prior to a presenter being able to know they have connected with their audience in this inspiring way, they must have positive feedback from some large and hopefully growing percent of the overall responses, expressing a favorable respect for the content and gratitude for the presenter sharing their findings generally. When the braids of the sheeple begin to turn from boo to ba, the shepherd will know his flock is growing more content. Thus, the goal of winning over the audience from a condition of more or less willful ignorance of the presenter's message into a condition of more or less complete acceptance of the validity of the presenter's message in absentia of the presenter's personage themselves, is the primary motivating factor for most public presenters if they choose to even acknowledge their audience as such at all. To lead by example, in other words, one must use the strategy of attracting more flies with honey than with vinegar. To lure in and convert to one's own cause the otherwise blank slate, empty minds of the average passerby, as one's audience, is the object and goal of almost all 
who present their information publicly, but not entirely all. The remainder do so in good faith. Their material deserves an audience, but do not seek to acknowledge their audience, nor to distinguish a target market for their data set at all. The vast majority of anyone's audience, while they are in public, is comprised of the group of trolls, who hate everyone and everything equally, and do not initially want to distinguish nor differentiate anyone nor anything as apart from this basic hatred and ambivalent ignorance. If it is accepted, as it generally should be, that the vast majority of people begin their interactions with one another in this mindset a priori, then it follows that not only nine out of every ten people we initially meet, but 100% of people, 100% of the time that approach us as strangers, are actually already more hostile to us than not. In this sense, it is true that humanity, however civil in appearance, remains untamed and uncivilized in our actions and behaviors, and such is part of our nature, wild and dangerous. Humans are no less a threat to one another than they are to other species, or than a lion is to its prey, the gazelle. Thoughtlessly, in any situation demanding such for their own survival, and at the drop of a pin, any human in society will revert to savagery if given the opportunity to excuse such by saying, I had no choice. People are overly eager to kill one another. This is a universal generality and a sad truth. Although this pre-existent condition of humanity is necessarily accepted as a prior given, Creative public presenters continually arise and attempt to turn the tide of history more in one direction or another by appealing to these people en masse as an audience. As such, intellectual appeals are less commonly successful than emotional, and logical fallacies are the norm of human communication and not the exception to the rule. Appeals to the audience in general are the mark of a low intellectual level of self-certitude in one's message. If you have to address the audience more or less directly, to ask them, why do I even bother talking to this person? As a Greek theatrical dramatist might turn away from the subject of some tragedy to address the chorus on behalf of the author of the play, often expressed as a deus ex machina or god machine, then one's argument should already be considered too lost to be regained. The worship of God machines, nevertheless, has so fascinated the mind's eye of the average audience member, however, that by now our society depends upon technology to survive. The figurative crutch of technological progress has proven to be no excuse for the ball and chain of commercial industrial pollution that has come with it. Thus, assuming the audience to be comprised, at first, 100% of trolls, the goal of the public presenter is, by their presentation of their data set and personal findings, to convince the trolls to accept as valid factuality the statements they pass across this communication's synapse and thus to connect with their audience. As stated before, when this occurs there is a definite and direct reaction palpable to the author or public presenter. When a person knows what they are creating will be viewed by many people, they may find it difficult not to succumb to this feeling of minor and brief euphoria associated with the virginal coming into fame and celebrity. Nevertheless, once a presenter has become known to the public at large and has attracted any sufficiently large size of an audience from among them, generally to induce word of mouth 
and gossip about themselves, the road to fame and stardom is paved with the lowest of evil acts. Once one has made the choice as an audience member of any given presenter's material to approach the presenter with hostility and to engage them in a debate, etc., with the pretext of disproving the presenter's veracity, they cease being a petty troll and become a full-blown stalker. A stalker is an enemy of a public presenter just as close to them yet faced oppositely relative to them as their friends, and some of their friends, if not ultimately all, may even become their enemies sooner or later. Thus, the survival of the public presenter is ever at risk simply for expressing their opinions to their fellow human beings. They are surrounded by friends on one side, enemies on the other, and caught between them in their crossfire. They do not know who, if anyone, to trust. This symptom of paranoia has gripped many to come to power, particularly during the 20th century, and usually resulted in antisocial or sexual fetishism as well. The fact of the matter is there is no one who a public presenter can trust, least of all whomever they should happen to have the misfortune of falling in love with. If behind every great man is a woman, and the gauge determining historical greatness among mankind has been their imperialism and the sum of souls they've slaughtered, then truly a man's worst enemy is whoever he loves most. Because the cycle of fame proceeds from attempting to convince trolls to become fans and continues on by producing friends from among one's fan base so that next from these friends one may develop enemies who couple with otherwise mundane trolls that by communicating their distaste for a person's public presentation become critics and thus stalkers who follow the careers of people they hate anyway. So one may ultimately become consumed into paranoia and psychosomatic self-loathing. There is no reward that can come from this process in the form of influencing the course of history in any way that can make up for its pitfalls and consequences. Once one has shared information with the public, they become a public figure, and, as such, public property, fully liable to be picked to pieces by cunning-tongued critics with a mind to convince anyone creative to commit suicide. The worst sort of human beings alive now, lower than deus ex machina worshipping cyborgs who are too distracted by texting to be able to drive safely, as low as actors, lawyers, politicians, and cops, are the stalkers who are public critics. Anyone who defames the work of someone else publicly must have some serious cause for such an insult against them, and this cause itself should be made hastily the source of public knowledge as well. If someone were to come up to you on the street and out of the blue, so to speak, say, fuck you, and slap you in the face, it would be neither more nor less insulting and rightfully alarming than to be dragged through the mudslinging and yellow journalism of the editorials and features sections of the entertainment media industry. Modern-day pundits have usurped journalism from real journalists and the journalistic integrity has gone out of the mainstream corporate-owned news. To be slandered by these subhuman swine is the lowest feeling in free society, and the burden of anyone to open their mouth against them by speaking out in public over their obtuse vocal din. 
If you feel called upon by some pretend God to fulfill as your fate the taking down, piece by piece, of the works of other human beings, and their rebuilding up into a likeness of your own form instead, if you feel bound by such honor to give advice, if you tell people how to live, you deserve the most foul and noxious hatred from your fellow human beings and from all the feathered fowl and salter freshwater fish alike. The whole cosmos should turn its back on you, to shun you, to scorn you, to mock you, to tease you, and to laugh at you behind your back, to applaud your failures, and to curse you to forever chase after, yet never possess success in their objective opinion. The whole world is watching, is a chant meant to shame and chide a person, because the world looks down on human beings with judgment, and most so when they are singled out under a spotlight for individual attention by the mobbing crowd. The person that comprehends at least is the biggest butt of this cosmic joke, that God may delight in man's misfortunes and take pleasure in our fall. Such are the components of those within my audience. The same as these groups of people who comprise my audience themselves. Within each of my audience members' minds, there is some ratio determining which of these four groups they are most alike relative to me, and thus causing them to side with and fall into line among one of these sort of groups more than any others. If the majority of a person's mind is made up one way, they will act out in that way and attract themselves to others who think and act alike themselves in that way as well. But all have within them the capacity to become to some extent, a fan even if a troll, a friend even if a fan, an enemy even if a friend, and a silent troll even if a vocal critic. Thus all have the capacity and likelihood to change from one state to another over time. It is the highest fortune a creative public presenter may hope for, to be invisible to have their message fall on deaf ears, and to be quickly forgotten without being singled out and crucified on cross-examination by the spotlight of fame as part of their duty as public servants, to live to old age and to die without descent of debts is a mere pipe dream yet to anyone who would nowadays seek asylum within the amphitheater of the public audience of humankind. 